Welcome to bonus episode 34 of Dr. G at the Heart of Healthcare. Happy Hospice and Palliative Care Month. I have a wonderful guest here, Jennifer O'Brien, the hospice doctor's widow. Hello. Hello. It's such a pleasure to be here with you, Dr. G. Oh, I'm so glad I got to meet you, uh, everyone. I had the privilege of meeting her in Little Rock. That's your hometown or it that's is. where you live, right? <laughs> uh, at the NHPCO Annual Leadership Conference. And you kicked off the keynote for us and just blew everyone away. Um, and so that was so powerful. And then I had the opportunity of seeing you at Inwell, which... Oh, so good. It's breathtaking. You know, I, 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 I still haven't posted my final pictures about that because I haven't even processed everything that happened. Um, I know I, I put here, like, imagine being in a room full of people who are sick and tired of the healthcare system, not doing death well. And they said, I'm going to do something about it. And then they did. And that's what Inwell was. Each person yep. did something huge. And we were all in one place. It was, it was so powerful. It really <sighs> was. Yeah. Yeah. Thank I'm you. I'm with you. I'm, I'm still processing it also. Yeah. Well, I yeah. want to give a shout out to Dr. Shoshana. I love her name yes. since it rhymes with my name, Keishana. Um, <laughs> just thank you for, for including me. You know, we had that hospice table talk and I'm late to the we party, did. but I'm here. I'm excited. I'm so glad she had it in my home city, LA. It was phenomenal. So it thank really was. you. Thank you to everyone. And I ran into my mentor and had the ugly cry. I just, everything was just, out of this world. So, all right. Well, first I want to just acknowledge as of this recording, we lost one of our first ladies, Jimmy Carter's wife died yesterday. Um, what'd you think about that? Oh, I thought it was remarkable that he's been on hospice for over six months. And of course she just transitioned to a hospice status a few days before she died, which is, um, you know, just interesting little setup there. Uh, mm -hmm. I think her, her situation is the more common one, right? People think they have six months, but they really don't because we're typically late to do that. But, um, and, and I have to say, I think I, I, I half ex more than half expect him to die pretty soon because he will not want to go on without her. Mm -hmm. I also think it's so beautifully sort of poetic and true that she died first because he would not want to wanted her to have to live without him. Um, you know, I, I I totally see that. I've I've seen that in in couples that have been together for a long time. Um, I actually a couple I knew many years ago. Uh, he was very sick. He had cancer. He was put on hospice. He, you know, physically was pretty healthy except for dementia. And he was getting closer. I mean, he was days, you know, he was al almost actively dying. And poof, she just died. And he died two days later. And it was beautiful. I, yeah, I, I'm with you. When I heard about it, I was thinking, wow, in in this first couple, the 39th first couple of the United States, we see the two types of hospice cases we have, you know, the ones that are on, you know, for the six months, and then the ones that, you know, come on right at the end. And so uh, it, it, it was quite interesting to, to have that, but we are sending our condolences to the family and just appreciate Absolutely. them for all of their service. I heard that she did so much for caregivers. We're going to say national uh, family caregivers month. Happy, happy honoring you all for everything that you do for the unpaid labor of love and labor of your blood, sweat, and tears for your families uh, and the sandwich generation, all you folks out there. 
um, she had a lot to uh, say and do for them. So we thank them. And, and it's so apropos today. Yes, it is indeed apropos. Apropos having you here. So I entitled today's episode, The Hospice Doctor's Widow and the Courageous Conversation of Precious Time. You're going to hear more about that precious time in a second. Um, But first, I just want to mention about the National Hospice and Palliative Care Month and the NHPCO's theme of Courageous Conversations. So they put out a press release right before we started and they just talked about um, a couple things and I I just wanted to mention it. It says, uh, in a culture that often teaches us to resist mortality and a healthcare system defined by interventionalism, the seemingly simple act of having a conversation about dying can have a profound impact. And then they say a couple things. What does death mean in my life? If I'm faced with a terminal diagnosis, how would my values shape my end of life journey? And how do I want my loved ones to engage with me toward the end of my life? It's difficult to think about these questions, but having these courageous conversations with ourselves, family, friends, and doctors can mean the difference between having the type of death a patient wants one that matches up with their values and desires, and one that doesn't allow them to have a say in their own end of life. Isn't that well put? It's very well put. And I I would add to that, you know, I have something I call the triad of certainty, which is at the end of life comes death. There are no do-overs in end of life and changed forever the loved ones remain and remember. So as important as that NHPCO statement is to the person who's dying, the thing of course that I focus on as someone who has outlived every single member of my family is the folks who go on and have to live with how they handled their loved one's death. Was it true to what the loved one wanted? Um, that really affects us for the West, for the rest of our lives. It, it affects us physically, it affects us emotionally and mentally, and to some degree, perhaps even spiritually. And so the conversations are super important uh, for the one who's ill or has a life-limiting condition. Yes, but they are just as important for those of us who survive and go on. Thank you for that. And and that's why you were the most perfect guest for this month's bonus episode for Hospice and Palliative Care Month because of all the things you are doing. Um, so, so let's just jump in so everybody can hear about this. So I won your book at the conference, at the <laughs> keynote. You know, I always have to mention I won. So I have this beautiful, gorgeous <laughs> journal here um, that is a book that you published and for everyone listening, um, she created this after taking care of her husband. Go ahead and tell your own story. Tell us, tell us how you wrote this book, but I'll, I'll, let me just say real quick. I I'll just set the stage for you. I won again. And I was so (laughs) struck in your keynote at the NHPCO conference and how you talked about the transitions of caregivers from um, someone taking care of the family to someone taking care of someone who's dying, how you talked about this book and how you correlated a caregiver's life to the PGY1 on-call night. That blew me away. And I think all those things are key to helping fix our healthcare system and addressing the issues we have. So let's just unpack it with your story. Okay. So my story is that I've been in healthcare for 35 plus years um, on the business and leadership side and have done serial leadership for very large physician practices. And I was down in Little Rock from Chicago, which is where I lived before, doing one of those interim leadership positions when I met Bob, my late husband. And he was a hospice and palliative care physician, and I fell in love. Um, And we fell in love, I should say, and Mm -hmm. just, you know, crazy about each other. Perfect, perfect, wonderful life together. Got married and the whole deal. And then, and then he got sick. He was diagnosed with a stage 
for metastatic renal clear cell carcinoma. And we knew um, that he would likely die of it or some complication from treatment. Um, and that was important because, um, you know, lots of folks who don't have those insights go into a diagnosis like that and they they think about fighting what they call fighting it, right? Mm. The, they, they, get, they engage in all sorts of, of war and sports metaphors that really don't get them very far in my opinion. Um, so, like so we knew that. Um, and we had some insights that a lot of folks don't have. Um, and I started keeping an art journal. Um, that's an interesting thing about the book. It is an art journal. So uh, I create these collages. Um, and then I mainly put the journal notes on top of the collages. So it's in enticing to look at um, it, the, the thoughts and the feelings are expressed in relatively small doses, which I think has served people really well, because when you're doing, when you're caregiving for someone you love, who is probably going to die before you, you know, you need things in small bits um, and you need pictures, I think, um, you know, so it, yes, it's sort of an odd book, but um but it, it works and it, and it's just my story. It's just my journal. Um, but those thoughts and feelings um, have turned out to be very, very helpful to lots of people. Um, so, so yeah. And um, fairly early on in um, his diagnosis and in the book is a page called precious time. Um, and I know, I don't know if you want to talk about that now or if we want to come back to it, but we can go that, with it. Okay. That's a, that's a concept that has become almost larger than the book itself for healthcare professionals and, and in turn for the rest of us. And that is Bob, my late husband would tell families when the, when the patient was getting close to death, he would say to them, you're in the precious time. And um, this was his way, and it was it was a, a, a it's a pretty word, right? Precious. It's a pretty word, and it's understandable. Precious time, he would say, is when you say what you need to say, and you don't say what you will re later regret. Precious time is for the, you know, the I love yous and the I'm sorrys and the thank yous and the we'll be okay without you. Um, it's okay to go. That's what precious time it is. It is that end of life phase um, that's so important that we have, that we designate it as such so that we can say what we have to say to each other. Um, what's What to me is tragic is when wrapped up in the cancer fighting metaphors and all that sort of stuff, we don't acknowledge that it's coming to an end. Um, and then in addition to the grief that one has for losing someone they love, they also have a bunch of regret and remorse for what they left unsaid or undone. Um, you know, the, I thought we had more time, right? To, to me and Bob, that is the worst thing you could hear. I, like yes. the notion that someone would go on after their loved one died and thought they had more time to be able to say, the I love yous or the I'm sorry's or whatever it is, that is just tragic. Um, just come. I, I know it's hard to hear that you're into precious time, but it's so much better to know it and to seize it um, so that uh, you go on after your person dies and you, yeah, you feel grief, but the grief is pure and it's, and it's based in love, um, not based in regret. Um, right. And so uh, that's been a, a really important part. I, I did talk at the NHPCO meeting about what is a really um, important phenomenon that I think we all in healthcare need to understand a little bit better. And that is um, the average duration for family caregiving is 4.9 years average. Mm -hmm. For me and Bob, it was 22 months. Um, for some people, right, it goes on for a decade, mm -hmm. um, but the average is 4.9 years. And as the family caregiver, 
Um, every single day, I am, the family caregiver is making sure that their care recipient gets a good meal, hopefully gets a good night's sleep, gets the medications on time. You know, we are doing everything in our power to help our loved one live fully with that, that life-limiting condition. And, and our entire identity is wrapped up in that and our sense of purpose. Um, it, is, it is beyond a full-time job. And, um, and, and then at the time at which the patient, the care recipient, it goes into a hospice status, then it's, it's just so important that the family caregiver has a big shift to make. They're making the shift from that life-sustaining work that they've been doing for years, possibly, um, to hospice and end-of-life family caregiver. And that's a totally different, right, focus. And some of some of the folks that are making that transition have never done the end of life part before. And so they don't understand that that's a completely different focus, that we're not worried about making sure they eat and they drink water and all that sort of stuff. We're, we're sort of settling into comfort if they, you know, if they, if they have, I remember when Bob was, you know, it wasn't so much when he was in hospice, but toward the end of his life, when he would get a hankering for a hamburger, well, well we would go get a hamburger because, right? Because, that's our precious time. And we're not going to worry about what he's eating or what he's not eating at that point, because, you know, his, his, his life is tapering off. His body is starting to shut down. So if he's hungry, we're going to feed him. If he's not hungry. We're not going to feed him. If he's thirsty, we're going to, right. So, so that's such an important shift different from the life sustaining family caregiving, right? Where I'm kind of nudging and pushing along, trying to make sure he has the energy that he has the sustenance. Um, and then the other thing you mentioned that I think is so interesting um, for physicians to understand, or as I should say helpful, um, that I the the scenario that I usually use to help physicians understand what it's like to be a family caregiver is that I suggest that they sort of close their eyes and hearken back to <laughs> their first few in-house uh, call nights during PGY one, right? And all the anxiety and the fatigue that came with that. And you'd work and work and work and you'd finally get back to the on-call room and you'd sit, you know, lie back in the cot and close your eyes. And sure enough, that pager or that cell phone would go off. And to the point that I've had more than one physician tell me they thought there was a camera in the on-call room, right? That just, <laughs> as soon as they'd close their eyes, right? Yes. And, so, and then they so ring. it's just <laughs> like that. It's, yes, it's just like, that with all that anxiety and all that um, fatigue and fear, except no four years of medical school, right? Mm -hmm. Family caregivers don't have four years of medical school. No ACGME 80 hour work week, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're on it 24 seven, 360 days, five days a year. Um, no, senior resident, uh, faculty member to catch your mistakes, right? Yeah. You've got that you're, when you're PGY1. You've got, you've got some fail safe there. Um, none of that exists. Mm. You have one patient. They mean everything to you. One patient, they mean the world to you. You, in my case, I knew he was going to die. I just didn't want to do anything that was going to make it a suffering death or something, you know, hasten it or whatever. It, it just, um, it's all of that and so much more. And that gives you an idea when you, when you think back to those nights um, in the on-call room and your PGY1 just gives you a little bit of a taste of what it is like to be a family caregiver every night, every single night. It's, it's high fevers. It's, you know, not, not having them slip in the bathroom. It's all kinds of stuff that is, that is uh, overload. 
Well, you know, I think that you having that insight of a physician's training and the personal experience of being the hospice doctor's wife and being a caregiver is key to igniting the compassion and empathy and hopefully action that non-hospice physicians will have to have courageous conversations, to take the precious time of their patients and offer palliative care to them at diagnosis like you were promoting, you know, at the death overdrafts, um, to, to give them that opportunity to seize the precious time uh, that people have. Because when you said what you said, it reminded me of just so many cases that I've experienced, but one that stands out to me. And, you know, I have this reminder in my office here where a daughter said, um, nothing was left unsaid. And that's how I know as a hospice physician that it was a good death that the person ended well, uh, because they're able to say that. Not that they're happy their loved one is gone or not going to miss them or not grieving. They can say, you know what? We're, we're okay. My right. mom was there. We did this. We sang this. We did whatever they say their story That's was. That's right. But they have, they're okay. And they can release it. And it's not spending the last month of life in a hospital and then finally going home for a couple hours, you know, just because you just gave up. Um, it, it's, it's, I don't know, letting them take control. So I'm so glad you have that, but you have a resource that doctors can use with the precious time. Could you tell me about that? Yes. Yes. On the resources page of my website, and I'm sure you'll put the link um, in your notes. And that Absolutely. is, it's called the precious time implementation guide for healthcare professionals. And I would Love, love for physicians and nurses and doulas and chaplains and anybody else um, to please download it and give it a read. Um, we got, I've got sort of the definition and, and some ideas about how to deliver that news. I've got some case studies in there about how it was that term helped um, professionals convey the information, the the news that they're that they're nearing end of life to the patients and the families. I've got a case study where it wasn't done and it was not good. Um, and so uh, I, I think it's a really a really good tool. It's been um, on my way. It's been available for a little over a month and already has about two hundred and fifteen downloads. Awesome. Um, and I've gotten lots of feedback on it from, from physicians, from nurses, doulas, et cetera, saying, oh my gosh, this is so, this is so helpful. So yeah, yeah, please do. Thank you yeah. for bringing that up, Dr. G. Of course. And we're going to get those downloads, uh, exponential because I think that is key to, again, uh, fixing our healthcare system and making end-of-life care better for folks. So thank you for creating that. Um, it's, just, have, it's just awesome. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Since we're talking about downloads, I have another one that might be really helpful. If I could just sneak in a little plug for of that. Course. And that is also on my resources page of my website. I did a um, position description for the position of family caregiver. Um, yes. And I think this one will be useful to both people in the family caregiver role and to healthcare professionals. Um, so I've been in, as I said, I've been in healthcare for 35 years in a number of leadership positions, which means I've hired lots of people. And one of the things you start with as you hire for positions is a position or job description as they are frequently referred to. Um, and so about a year ago, I started to think about like, what if I had to hire for this position of family caregiver? What would that job description look like? And I created it. It is very comprehensive. I did get um, some input. I had, I vetted it through a couple of, you know, nurses and a, a, a physician friend who, um, 
is a pediatrician and also has an adult son who had a C2 spinal cord injury. And so she is also a family caregiver. And um, so we did some, you know, I got some input from them, did a very thorough document. If you're a family caregiver, it is going to help you put into words and really feel validated in what it is all that you do. Um, if you are a health, a, a professional caregiver, um, you need to download it also because you are going to be utterly stunned at what this position encompasses. Um, the first, one of the nurses that I had look at it said, you know, family caregivers don't give intramuscular injections. Oh, yes, they do. Oh, yes, they do. Um, family caregivers do a lot that um, after just a couple talk about see one, do one, teach one. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's it's pretty intense um, family caregiving. So, yeah. So please check out that download also. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up because I forgot, but it's so apropos being family caregivers month and again, reconciling and bridging the caregiver role and them feeling empowered and validated with the healthcare providers, the physicians valuing it when they put themselves in our year one, you know, anxiety yeah. and fatigue. I think that's going to wake people up and people need to hear this. It's going to take everyone to fix our system at the end of life. Uh, to make people end well, you know, again, shout out to Shoshana with uh, end well to try to shift the culture. So we're going to each all keep doing what we're individually doing to change things. And I think it's going to just be a big conglomerate just to make it all come together and move things in the right direction. Because there's, there's too many great things happening in our community um, for it not to be. And you've put together these academic items. I think we needed this so that, you know, again, it can, it can spark that revolution. So I will definitely have the job description in the show notes for the family Wonderful. caregivers. I will definitely have um, your precious time implement implementation guide in the show notes because that's what's going to change everything. And you are our valuable resources today. You're our valuable resource today yeah. with a ton of valuable resources. So Thank um, you. you're welcome. Was there anything you wanted to, to say before we let the people go in this holiday just, week? Just a huge, a huge thank you for, for listening and for, and for giving this some time and thought. Yeah. yeah. And I put together the phrase, courageous conversations help people use their precious time to end well. Yay. That's our whole week, right? That's right. All right, everyone. Well, thank you for joining me today. Um, it's been another bonus episode of Dr. G at the Heart of Healthcare, the Hospice Doctor's Widow, and Courageous Conversations of Precious Time. I thank you all for joining us. Uh, look out for another bonus episode for the holidays up my sleeve. And hopefully you all got your copy of The Real Deal About Hospice and join those book clubs that I have going. So I just thank you for being here, Jennifer, and I'm sure I will see you again. I'm sure. Thank you, uh, Dr. G. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. All right. Peace, everyone. <laughs>